This week we want to continue in a study that we've been going through for several weeks, uh, along with a few breaks here and there, from 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13, where Paul coming to the end of this book tells them to watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. And all of these, as we've noted in previous lessons, are, if they are not militaristic terms themselves, certainly can be used in regards to the military. And when you look at the book of 1 Corinthians, since Paul was dealing with so many problems in the congregation, and he tells them basically all of the things or many of the things that they're doing wrong that they need to correct. No doubt there would have been some resistance to it. And so there was a need for these types of admonitions. We had looked at the first three of those and we're looking at the fourth one as to be strong. And we noted that while a lot of people put this with the previous one, quit you like men, because in many respects they do go together. You cannot act or be courageous, be manly, without the proper accompanying strength. And so there is a, an aspect that they go together, but in reality all four of them go together and tie themselves with each other. But in Ephesians 6, chapter, verse 10 and verse 11, Paul tells them, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And so we start learning that our strength comes from God. It does not come from other things, but our strength originates from God. So we had to look at, and we began looking at last time, how the Christian is strengthened. And while there's those who are teaching now, uh, and it's becoming more and more popular, it has been for numerous years, or even decades, in relationship to liberal groups, it's becoming more and more popular even among conservative Christians. This idea that the Spirit directly... Holy Spirit upon our spirit strengthens the Christian. It is really nothing more than the copying of John Wesley's doctrine, Wesleyanism, and taken primarily from Ephesians 3 and verse 16. And we studied that and how that uh, it is really a misuse of that because the scriptures show us very clearly that it comes from the writings of the scriptures, that the Spirit is using that which he has revealed to the apostles and they wrote down so that, if you look at the very first part of the third chapter, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. That's how God is going to strengthen us. It is when we read the Spirit's message. When we read that spirit, the Spirit's message, then we will be strengthened. That's why David could say, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. What is? I can be strong against uh, the temptations that come my way. How? By having God's word in, our life, in my life, in my heart. Uh, and thus Paul would tell the Ephesian elders, as he's speaking to them in Acts 20 and verse 32, that I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. The word of God, the word of his grace, that which the Spirit has revealed to the apostles and they wrote down, that's what is able to build them up. That's what is able to strengthen them. And so we looked at that aspect, but then we also noted that another way in which we are strengthened is through prayer. Uh, in the Christian armor that Paul sets forth in Ephesians 6 chapter, 
beginning at verse 10 and the admonitions to be strong, and then he describes that Christian armor. He ends it by saying in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And thus the need for prayer. And there's the old adage that prayer will prevent sin, and sin will prevent prayer. The two do not go together. When we pray, we can prevent our sins. When we start committing sin, and sin enters into our life, you will see an individual quit praying, because they do not go together. The strength that we can find thus is in prayer. That's why Paul would, or Christ would tell Peter, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Why? Because prayer can help us to overcome temptation. And that's true for us, even as it would have been for Peter if he had prayed. Uh, he, of course, fell asleep instead of praying. And a few hours later, he uh, denies our Lord three times. And again, if you go back, what, would he have been able to overcome that if he had been praying during that period of time instead of sleeping? Or we can, if we will stop and when we are tempted, if we'll stop and pray before we enter into that temptation, we can overcome the temptation. We can overcome the sin. Uh, and so prayer will strengthen us. We can be strong in prayer. But another way to be strong is to work. We gain strength by taxing our muscles. If an individual wants to be a weightlifter, he doesn't go lay down in a couch all day long. He gets to the gym and he starts lifting weights. And he continues to lift weights and as he exercises those muscles, the muscles begin getting stronger. What? He is putting the muscles to work so that he can become strong. Now, that's just the way it's done. We know that. When you go to the couch, though, and you lay on the couch all day long, then your muscles start getting weaker and they atrophy. We waste away in that situation. To grow spiritually, thus, we need to simply get to work. There's work to be done in being a Christian and living the Christian life. And if we're going to be strong ourselves, we just need to get out and get to work in that spiritual realm. Doing the things that God wants us to do. In spite of the fears that we might have, the trepidation that we might have in talking to someone, for example, about the gospel of Christ. They might ask me something I don't know. Well, so what? There's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know, in spite of what some of us think. And I put myself in that category. Always got to have an answer for everybody. Well, no, you don't. There's some things that you don't know. You never will know. There's some things you just say, have to study that and find out about it. Or just our very nature many times of going up and talking to someone. Get to work. There's things to be done, spiritually speaking. Going out and visiting people. Encouraging those who are wayward. Encouraging those who are weak. Go out and help people. There's work that needs to be done. If we want to grow spiritually speaking and become strong, we're going to have to work. If we stop working within the kingdom of God, then just as our muscles start atrophying when we stop working, we will begin atrophying from a spiritual standpoint. In 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, 
Paul has gone through in this chapter that Christ was raised from the dead. And he's become the first fruits thus of those who are raised. Proving that there is going to be a resurrection. And he comes to now the very end of the, this section. And he says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, in other words, based upon all of this that we've said about the resurrection of Christ and our resurrection, that we're going to be, have a bodily resurrection. Based upon that now, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And he adds, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, it's going to be profitable. We may not see it initially. We may not ever know about it. But our work in the Lord will be profitable. It will not be in vain. It won't be worthless. It won't be valueless. If for nothing else, it will strengthen us and help us thus to overcome sin within our life. Thus, we get to work, knowing that it will be profitable for us. One of the things that uh, we see in relationship to someone who's had surgery is almost immediately, get them up, get them walking, get them exercising, get them working. And then you send them to rehab to make sure that they work a whole lot more. And that uh, physical therapist, you want to hit them sometimes and you hate them because they're going to make you work harder and harder and harder. Why? Because they want to strengthen us. They want to strengthen those muscles that have become weaker. Get to work. If we want to become stronger, we have to go out and we have to start working. And that's going to be true from a spiritual standpoint. If we want the congregation here at Bellevue to be strong, we're going to have to work as a congregation. If I, Michael Hatcher, want to be strong, I'm going to have to work in relationship to the spiritual matters of God. If you, as an individual, want to be strong, I have to get to work, I have to do the will of God, I have to be out involved in doing, actively engage in the work of the Lord. And of course, it's going to bring great profit to us. It will not only make us stronger, it will fit us for heaven. Remember Revelation, the 14th chapter, in verse 13, where John has said, the Spirit tells him to write, Blessed are they that die in the Lord from henceforth. Well, there's a blessedness of those who are Christians in death. But then he adds, Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. That work that you're going to be doing for the Lord in the here and now, it's going to follow us. It's going to be profitable for us. It's that, that's the individual who's going to be blessed. You fail to work in the here and now, then are you going to receive the blessing, blessings of God at death? Well, if we're going to be able to rest from our labors, that means we're going to have to be laboring in order to receive that rest. If we're not laboring, if we're not working for the Lord, we're not going to receive the rest. And so we need to get to work. We also need to avoid evil influences to be strong. We talked uh, this morning about uh, Romans 12th chapter and verse 2, to be not Conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't, using our, the language that we're using now, you need to avoid evil influences. You're not like those in the world. Avoid that. You've been transformed from that so live the Christian life. 
if you go back into the first Corinthian letter and you go back into that chapter dealing with the resurrection, chapter 15. There were individuals at Corinth who were teaching there is no resurrection from the dead. And that entire chapter is showing the error of that doctrine. But in the midst of it, verse 33, he tells them that evil companionships corrupt good morals. Now why is that in the middle of a discussion of the resurrection of the dead? Because there's a very basic principle that is found there. You associate with these individuals over here who are teaching this false doctrine, and guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to go into that false doctrine. So what is it? That evil companionship, in the case of 1 Corinthians, and the discussion there in, that he is engaging in, the false teacher. That individual, you continue to associate with him, that's where you're going to be. Uh, the same principle is in relationship to any evil of any kind. You continue to engage in association with evil and with sin. You, you put yourself in that type of a situation. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to end up in that sin. If somebody wants to change their life, the very first thing that they have to do in order to accomplish a change is to change their associations. If you never change the association, you're never going to change your life. You go out into our society today and you talk to these, try and talk to these kids who are getting into trouble. You talk to criminals who... You know, they've been involved and they've gone to jail. They're getting out. Guess what they've got to do in order to change their life? They've got to get away from the people who caused them to end up there. That means they've got to change their association. They've got to avoid the evil influences. And if they go back to those evil people that they've been associating with in the past, they're going to go right back into that lifestyle. Now, we can generally understand that in relationship to someone in the world who we're trying to get them to change their life. Why can't the Christian recognize that in relationship to evil as well? That if we want to stay away from sin... If we want to be strong ourselves, we're going to have to avoid evil influences. We cannot go out and continue to live along with people in sin and associate with them all the time and avoid it ourselves. One of the blessings that God has given unto us is a fellowship. The idea of fellowship is we have a joint participation. Why? Because we need to avoid evil influences. And if we don't associate and have that fellowship in Christianity, in being strong in Christ, then we're going to fall into the sin. So you're not conformed to this world. We avoid the evil influences. Paul would encourage the, these same Corinthian brethren in the second letter that he writes to them. This same principle, look at chapter 6 and verse 14. To be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he starts, what fellowship has uh, righteousness with unrighteousness? Communion, of, or what communion hath light with darkness? And so forth. Skip down to verse 17. And then he tells them, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. 
and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So many times we want to become a Christian, but then continue our association with people in the world. In reality, people in the world will not want to be around the Christian. Because the Christian's whole aim, his life, his whole purpose in life is living the Christian life and trying to do what's right. And that person in the world isn't trying to do that. They have no interest in it. And so why are they going to associate with someone who does? they will pull off from the Christian because there is that separation between light and darkness. Christ came into this world. And what did the world do? Hated him because they were in the darkness and he was setting forth light. They separated themselves from him. They left him when he began teaching. Look at John 6, chapter. And there's all of these thousands of people who are following him. And he begins teaching them. What happens? They leave. Brethren, when we're living the Christian life, oh, look at Ephesians 5 and verse 11. To have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. How long do you think that person who is living in sin wants to be around you when you're reproving their sin? Or are they very quickly going to say, I don't have need for this and leave? What is it? There is a clear distinction between righteousness and evil. The two cannot coexist. When we're trying to live the righteous type of life, we're going to avoid evil. We have to stay away from it, but they're going to stay away from us when we start really living the type of life that God wants us to live and to expose evil. And that's the idea of reprove there in uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 11. You're exposing it. You're showing that it's wrong. You're telling that individual... This what you're doing is wrong, it's sinful, it's contrary to what God wants you to do. And when you do that with people, how long will they be around you? They're going to leave. We cannot continue to associate with them because what's going to happen? In order to continue association with those individuals that we're exposing, that we're showing are evil and sin, and sin we're either going to have to compromise or they're going to repent and change or there's going to be a separation between the two. Now, if they repent, yes, that's what the ideal situation is. That they turn away from their evil and turn to God and do what God wants them to do. Wonderful. But what if they don't? How long will we stay with those evil? that which is evil. But as long as we're staying with the evil, and instead of, instead of avoiding evil influences, it's going to destroy us. And so a way to be strong, yes, avoid evil influences. I mean, look at Paul as he's writing this letter, of course. Paul had to exercise himself. He had to work. And he says it in, specifically in relationship to having a conscience void of offense before God. Look at Acts 24th chapter and verse 16 as he says this. That herein do I exercise myself to, all, to have always a conscience void of offense before God and toward men. Well, a conscience void of offense before God or toward God. In other words, I have to work 
I have to exercise myself. I have to engage in this battle. Why? So that I can remain a Christian. So that I can remain in a right relationship with God. And that sin will not come into my life. A conscience void of offense toward God. And yes, toward all men, because he considered himself debtor to all men. I am debtor to preach the gospel unto all men. Read Romans first chapter, first few verses, or down through verse 16. And so his desire was to go to Rome as well and preach the gospel to them. Why? Because he felt debtor. I have an, a debt that I must pay to all men. And so, in order to do that, I'm out preaching the gospel to all men. Do we have that same feeling of debt toward our friends and our neighbors, our work associates, our loved ones, so that we will work to, in preaching the gospel to them and teaching them and trying to bring them to Christ? We should have. That's getting out and working so that we can enjoy that rest. When we exercise ourselves properly, though, that's when we become prepared for stronger meat. In Hebrews 5th chapter and verse 14, Paul says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Someone who is weak, who does not really know right from wrong many times, it's because they have not exercised themselves and their senses to where they're able now to discern right and wrong, good and evil. That's the consequences of our failure to exercise ourselves. Only by being strong in all of these ways, studying God's word through prayer, by avoiding evil influences, by getting out and working for the cause of Christ, when we do those things, then we become prepared for strong meat. We can look and we, we can then look at a situation and determine, is this wrong or is this right? Is this good or is this evil? But when we fail in those areas, then sin comes upon us because we don't know right from wrong. We cannot make those determinations. And so in order to, to be strong and to overcome sin, be strong in the Lord, we have to be strong in these ways. We strive against sin so we can face greater temptations. And the, when those greater temptations come upon us, we can be strong against them and we can overcome them. Because we've overcome them in the past. Again, use the figure of a weightlifter. Someone who's just starting out lifting weights. He can't go to the weights and put a, you know, several hundred pounds on it, on the bar, and lift it. But if he starts out at a lighter weight, and he starts exercising, and he starts continuing the, his work, after a certain length of time, he's going to be able to put all of that weight on there and be able to lift it. He wasn't able to before, but he's able to now. Why? Because he has worked. He's grown strong. That's what we as Christians have to do. Yes, we start out as a babe in Christ. There's going to be things that we don't know, that we don't realize. We don't have our senses exercised to discern good and evil. 
And so we overcome these smaller things within our life and we grow stronger each time we overcome them. And later on, we can overcome the stronger things, the greater temptations, because we've exercised ourselves from a spiritual standpoint so we can now stand against the wiles of the devil. After these four militaristic imperatives, Paul gives another one, though, very next verse. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 14. Let all your things be done with charity. Here, the word charity is the, word, is the Greek noun agape. Agape, there's both a verbal form and a noun form. Both of them are used within the New Testament. The verbal form would be agapao. Noun form is agape. This is a noun form. It has little to do with emotions. There might be emotions that are involved, but it really does not deal with emotions. Instead, it deals with a decision of the mind, a decision that an individual makes that he's going to do what is in the best interest of another individual, regardless of what they might desire. They might desire one thing, but we might know that something else is better for them. That's what love is when we give them that which they need instead of what they desire. In raising children, we all know of situations like that. We know a child wants something. And we as parents say, no, you can't have it. Because we know that 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 they want isn't good for them. And so we refuse. And we give them many times something that is good for them. No, as a child, eat your vegetables. And I can remember my dad standing over me with a belt saying, unless you eat those, uh, and giving me a time frame to eat them. And I waited until right at the last second, and then stubbed them all in my mouth. Now, why would he do that? Because he knew that eating those veggies was good. It's helpful. And so I ate them even though I didn't want them. But that's what was good for me. That's what love is all about. It's not an emotion. It is knowing this is what is good for this individual and thus I'm going to give them what is good. It might not be what they want. I didn't want those vegetables. To me, they didn't taste good. They still don't. I still don't like them. But yet they were given to me and I had to eat them. Because my parents knew that they were good for me. And so that's what love is all about. Biblical love from a agape standpoint. Even though I didn't want it, get it anyway. This is what you're providing. Jesus taught us <clears throat> that the entire law is summed up with the idea of love. And this is agape type love. First, love for God, and then loving our neighbor as ourself. The lawyer comes to Jesus and he asks him, what is the greatest commandment? Of course, the Jews had argued over this for years and year, for centuries as to which law was the greatest commandment. They had 613 different laws. All of them argued among themselves that this law was great. No, this one is. No, this one. And so you had 613, theoretically, you had 613 different groups all arguing that this is the greatest law. So here's the law. You're asking, which one is it? Which one of these 613 laws is the greatest law? And Jesus very simply said, 
here it is, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is likened to it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You want to argue about these 613 laws that are found uh, according to the Jewish tradition in the law of Moses? You want to argue about those 613 laws? Go right ahead. Pick whichever one you want to. It can be summed up in one of those two, loving God or loving your fellow man. The lawyer recognizes the truthfulness of the answer. You're right. That is true. That is what is true love, or what is a summation of the law and prophets. That is the greatest commandment. And that is the second greatest commandment. Recognize the truthfulness of it. We must love as well. That's the type of thing that we must have in relationship to God. We must love God with our entire being. Our heart, mind, soul, body, everything that is man, love God first and foremost. Above our own selves, above our family, above friends, above the things of this world, the cares of this world, Above anything else, love God first and foremost. And then to love our fellow man even as we do ourselves. Let me just introduce this, and we won't, enter, we won't discuss it this evening, but we'll enter into it more next day evening, Lord willing. Loving God first and foremost within our life Loving Him with our entire being, heart, soul, mind, body, means that we're going to love His Word as well. You cannot love God without loving His Word. And that means we're going to have to be obedient to it. We're going to have to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. A person doesn't obey the gospel... That is all that God has said, not the way that man wants to change it and alter it, but what God actually says, unless you do that, you don't really love God. Then if you don't continue to live the Christian life, you don't really love God. Loving God means you're going to love what God says to do. You're going to love His Word. And you're going to continue to live that type of a lifestyle. Why? Because that is love of God. When you stop living that type of lifestyle, it's because you do not love God. And you've allowed something else, a love of something else, to take precedence over your love for God. So if you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ this evening, upon your faith, repenting of your sins, making that confession of your faith, being baptized in water, love God enough to do that, to obey His will. If you've become a Christian, have you continued to live the way in which God set forth? To obey His will? To live faithful to that word? Have you loved God within your life? Continue to love Him first and foremost? Or have you fallen away and allowed love for something else to come in and take precedence over the love for God? If that's the situation, then come back into Him. Repent of your sins. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them. And once again, do the first works as Jesus told the church in Ephesus. Why they had left their first love. So repent and do the first works. So if you need to repent and once again do the first works, we would encourage you to do that as we stand and sing the invitation song.